Hi, everybody. How are you doing? It's the last session of the day, isn't it? Wow. You're like, it better be good. I'm tired. <laughs> OK. So we're going to talk about launching patterns for containers, which is a super fun topic. Almost better than security. OK. Um, my name is Michelle Arubastavante. I'm here. Uh, I have a company called Alliance. We do uh, a lot of different types of consulting, but my practices are security and microservices. Um, so we've done a lot of different platform deployments with customers over the past few years as this sort of space evolves. And so I've been, um, uh, you know, this is actually a new talk that I'm bringing just to kind of go over some of the patterns that I've seen with launching containers and also some of the scheduling issues and things that go on. So with that, um, I'm going to get started. So the first thing I guess, whoa, it's not really advancing. First thing I guess that's worth talking about is um, the container platforms that we might discuss. So we've got a lot of choices. There are hosted platforms like Amazon and Azure, and then actually many other third-party platforms, right, who try to provide you with a containerized deployment model that is managed in some way. And then we've got, uh, so Google, Azure, and Amazon being the big three, right? And then we've got the platforms that sit on top of that. So Google Container Engine based on Kubernetes. Um, uh, Amazon actually has its own proprietary, um, partially PaaS, and then mostly IaaS implementation. And then we've got, um, in, in Microsoft's uh, Azure, we have uh, the Azure Container Service, which is really just a quick way to deploy any of the three orchestrations, which would be Swarm, Docker Swarm, uh, DCOS, uh, and also Kubernetes now. And so there, there's that option, plus just doing straight VM anywhere you want to go with those three platforms I just mentioned, right? Um, Service Fabric is more of an internal proprietary uh, implementation of not necessarily a container engine only, although it now supports containers, but a scheduler of its own right for Service Fabric native applications. The reason that I bring up all of those is really, um, I don't know why this is here, by the way. Can we go away? I, I have no idea what that is. Sorry. Some sort of Dropbox thing. Um, so a lot of them have things in common, right? The idea being that I have a management cluster, and the management cluster is responsible for understanding the health of all these nodes, which is where you deploy your actual services. It's also responsible for the scheduling aspect, which is deployment, right? So deployment is scheduling and orchestration. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's any order, like orchestration it means in other uh, situations. Uh, it just means that it's looking for a place to schedule, deploy, uh, bring alive, keep healthy the services that you uh, describe. And those could be single service microservices, or it could be a composition of multiple services in a microservice described by some sort of task. Uh, so these are common commonalities between all of the platforms, and so I think that's just the first foundation that I would provide here. Now, the infrastructure behind that is going to be that you have a management cluster of some sort. You have an agent node cluster of some sort. It's not cheap to run these things, so you're usually looking for server density in order to make this worth your while. You're looking for a new platform that's going to be able to host many different applications that you might be building and deploying. It's not just one, like we would think about with VMs in the past, right? where I have a bunch of websites on this set of nodes and a bunch of APIs on these, and you might sort of isolate them pragmatically so that they don't step on each other, right? So for, for, multi, for basically tenant uh, noisy neighbor isolation, right? And so we're, we're looking for a platform that can give us the noisy neighbor isolation without having to deal with having separate sets of clus clusters, for example. So we're going to have probably three nodes in our management cluster. We're going to have probably closer to five in our agent cluster realistically once you start deploying real things. Not because your services each individually take a lot of overhead, but because if you're using services like Kronos for scheduling or Kafka for messaging or Elasticsearch for that type of thing, you're basically already then installing three big things that normally would have their own three node cluster. So if you can fit those onto your five nodes, then that's not a bad thing as long as the machines are big enough. 
Um, we also need things like a discovery infrastructure. That means sometimes part of the discovery process, how do I get to that service if it's got five instances spread across the nodes? I'm going to have some form of load balancer that's stitched up to the actual physical uh, public agent, let's say. And then that's got to have a way of routing within the cluster. So that's a typical model, um, but some of it's infrastructure-based, so I'm just bringing it up here. We also have the um, Docker registry. That will be where you actually deploy your images, and so we need that accessible. If we're on-prem, uh, we sometimes can still baseline on a cloud-based registry. I would highly recommend that, so it can be a hosted thing that you don't have to manage. Um, and then that way, you know, what, it, what does it mean? If you're not connected to the internet from your office that day, you're not deploying that service. So what are the odds of that? Probably pretty low. Is it worth taking the risk so you don't have to manage this all year round? Absolutely, right? So that's, that's my philosophy. Um, there are some core features inside these platforms that you care about. Uh, service registration and discovery, meaning when I deploy a service or schedule it, somehow it has to get uh, stitched up to the load balancing and discovery mechanism. So there has to be a way for clients calling the service to get to the one or more instances of this API, for example. And when I add another instance, it should automatically join that group, right? So there's processes for that that are maybe different within each of the orchestration engines, but it's a big, important piece. And that involves load balancing and routing as well. Sometimes it's tied to the infrastructure a little bit. So like in Amazon, you would actually use a, a Amazon or ALB, which is really ELBB2. So it gives you routing capability at the uh, physical you know, infrastructure layer, and then it would route into your uh, ECS cluster, for example. So those are some features that matter. Auto-scaling is part of it. So this is all really part of scheduling, right? Because scheduling means deploying. Deploying means being available and spread across the load balancer and somehow be reached. It also means auto-scaling, so the ability to uh, add more containers when I have uh, maybe a lot of burst requests for a particular API and it's using a lot of its CPU and memory, then it should spin out a couple of more until it doesn't need them anymore. So there's things like minimum health is two instances, maximum could be up to five or ten, you could put a limit on that. And then we have self-healing. When something goes wrong, it should try to recover. So we see sometimes situations where a node will flap, for example. And the reason that that happens is something is failing and it's not able to stay running. Um, that wouldn't happen with an API or a website where you just have an error. It would happen maybe with something more severe, right? Where it can't actually reach with a health check one of its uh, data assets or something like that. So you've decided to incorporate a data asset check in the health check. And by doing that, you're, you're making sure that the service reports lack of health for the right reasons. Um, so we'll see an example of that. But the idea is we want it to be self-healing. We also want it to be upgradable. So I should be able to deploy new services and have them schedule and then have the old services retire. In, in an appropriate way, right? So that means that the old service, the original V1, for example, will stay alive and healthy and will keep running until we have successively spun up the new V2 and have that stitched up to that load balancer and then it will drain the, the V1, right? So there's a process for that that usually you wouldn't have to get involved in. And then we've got um, you know, versioning, which is really just another piece that's a little bit more finessed by you, which is how do we want to handle backward compatibility with APIs and things? The main thing we want to point out is that scheduling and orchestration should not imply order. So you should be able to take a microservice and deploy it and update it and not affect the rest of your ecosystem of services if you've done it right. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't bring up a V2 and nobody's using it yet. And that doesn't mean that you can't version the internals as long as you're backward compatible, but it means that you're thinking about those things and you're not depending on order of orchestrated deployment, if that makes sense. So these are core features that we expect to be provided with any of the orchestration engines or platforms. And so um, just to point out, again, scheduling starts with scheduling. Uh, meaning we have take a service description and that will be uh, maybe a compose file or an equivalent across the various platforms that will describe 
what service are we deploying? Is there more than one? Is there any sort of networking DNS to be described? Um, are there environment variables that should be made available? Because ideally, I'm building images, I'm pushing them to a registry, and those images are immutable. So when I develop and check in and have CI available or set up, then I'm going to have images generated every time I check in. And those images will not be touched again, and they will be marked as latest and v whatever. And then they will be tagged with maybe some other tags that help it get deployed to Amazon or Azure or wherever the container system is. And that image can stay um, as is and get promoted through the ecosystem of tests and you know, acceptance and UAT and, and prod. And so that way you've got this immutability. And the only thing that would change is the task definition, the service description, uh, all these are interchangeable terms. Uh, the compose file, the environment variables that help it get launched. That means choosing ports or letting it be dynamic ports, things like that. So the service description is applied and usually sent to the leader, and then the leader decides, hey, based on all these healthy nodes I have, who's got space, where should I schedule you? And if it can't successfully bring it up on one node, it'll go to another and another and another. So that's the idea. Okay. Okay. So. Um, that's a green screen, in case you're wondering. Um, one of the things I want to point out, this is something that I did in uh, a Swarm demo, but I don't want to get into Swarm because we're going to do other better things. Um, but the idea is, if I have a couple of agents and I have a certain amount of CPU and memory available, and I have a container running, likely that container has reserved some space, some CPU, some memory, a port, and those are resources, and those resources are finite. So the idea is your container or your task description should be in indicating what are the resources I need to run so that the scheduler, orchestration engine, can decide how best to purpose and move those containers around. You can also do interesting things like have affinity, like I should always be located with this one because I want to actually do DNS on the same machine for some reason instead of distributing out through the load balancer. That would be one example that could happen, although that's probably rare. It's just an example. Um, another would just be because you know maybe you want them co-located so that they use the same resources and you've got Let's say you had seven nodes in your cluster, and you want these two to be just for Kafka-related activities, or three, probably, because it would have to have uh, at least three or five. So you would say, these are going to be just my, my Kafka nodes. I'm going to give them a tag. That's the only kind of thing that's going to deploy there. And then you know the rest of the nodes are for the rest of the services. So it's a nice way to correlate how things should live together in your cluster. Make sense? So one of the things that will happen is you know, you'll deploy containers, and they will use whatever they have requests. They'll reserve it, so it's not available for anybody else. Resource constraints then have things like physical hardware limitations, like disk space, I.O., so on. Um, port reuse would be another one, right? I can't deploy uh, containers with a fixed port and expect to get more than one on a machine. But if I let it be dynamic port, which I should, then it should just use whatever ports available and stitch up to the load balancer. And that's usually what we would expect to happen. Um, explicit constraints on CPU and memory and I.O. are a bit more challenging because you have to do some drills before you go live to production to figure out what we really need. You're going to have some services that are memory, memory intensive because they maybe cache a lot of things, like a shopping cart or something like that. Um, there's going to be other services that are I.O. intensive because they're maybe having a lot of communication to other APIs or things like that. Um, so the idea is that you have to learn a little about your services. You're going to start off with a bit of a swag. Uh, I think I don't need much for this service to run. And then you're going to get surprised because it won't run. And then you'll say, well, maybe we need to rethink that. And you'll start to learn the characteristics, the personality of each of these services. So before you go live, you'll take the time to drill because not just because I said so, but that would be one good reason. Another good reason would be because if you don't, you could take risks on your go live in production, right? Like that's not a good thing to do. Um, we've been through this exercise and gotten pretty close and still gone live and had a couple of things surprise us over time. So that's why you monitor and have logs and all of those other fun things that are required to live 
safely in a microservices world. So, um, you know, the node distribution is going to be determined by these constraints that you provide, and those are things that you can do at the command line, for example, as part of, you know, uh, running the Docker container, and that's the kind of thing that's happening for you when you schedule. So we'll take a look at uh, task description and so on. And the other main thing, the reason that this is so valuable is the noisy neighbor protection, right? So now our containers are actually asking for what they need, and they're not going to be able to get more. And so they start, you know, pegging at their own memory that they've allocated, like two gig of RAM, then they're going to need to spin up another instance somewhere and find another machine that's available for that. So that's the sort of auto scale story that goes with that. Make sense? OK, so another green screen. Um, because I just wanted to point out that you know when you do try to schedule something and ask for more than is available, so let's say I already am using 3 gig of the 3.5 available on this machine, then when I do that scheduling instruction and if none of the machines are available to launch, it will say you know no resources available to schedule. Of course, this is me doing this in the command line just for the sake of having a bit more close touch and feel on what's happening. But this is the stuff that internally the orchestration engines are doing for you, right? So you're just describing what you need, and it's handling the rest for you, OK? So we're looking for server density. That's one of the main things. The colors are really not related to anything except to indicate they might be different microservices. So pick your own colors. Um, the idea being, you know, I might start out where I'm not using a lot of the three nodes, but as soon as I start deploying multiple instances of services and I start to add other applications, because you should be able to co-locate multiple applications in a distribution, right? And so eventually, I hope to fill those nodes really tightly so to where you know, I'm making a, taking advantage of every bit of space available across all of my applications. So I'm now getting what I pay for, right? Now, the good thing about this is you can do it. The bad thing about this is you need some spare, because if you don't have spare, then this little red guy gets deployed, but you need two for health, and he's saying, what about me? I don't have a place to go, and you simply won't be able to schedule that service. That instance cannot launch. The other thing that will happen is even restarting a service, when you do the restart command, it needs to spin up a new instance and then get it stitched up to the load balancing environment, and then drain the other one. And that process requires space. So you have to have some free space. So you want to be alerting and monitoring on your nodes to know uh, that you're getting close to, you know, let's say, 60% CPU usage or memory usage, that kind of thing, because you want to have some spare. I have almost no spare on my cluster right now because I've been running it for three days doing workshops and things. And I literally had to go in and brute force delete a whole bunch of containers to make this demo work today. So that was fun. Um, but you know, those are the things that happen when you're doing testing because you're not really having a smooth deployment process and you make a lot of things fail for fun or not. Um, so scheduling variations, um, you might have things like long running tasks. Long running tasks would be things like your websites. Um, not everybody puts websites in a container infrastructure, but there's really no reason not to. Um, that's more of a strategy that is around your microservices, uh, you know, uh, I guess plan as a, as a solution. For example, some companies, uh, already have these monolithic websites, and they're happily hosted in Azure Paz, let's say. Azure Paz is nice, and it's easy, and you know they've got a couple of five different nodes that are load balanced and multi-regional over traffic manager, and no need to change all that. But maybe the reason they need the five nodes is because they also have all their APIs up there, and because everything's co-located like a monolith. So they could start breaking it up and move the APIs into a service tier, allow that to scale out more widely, and then eventually slim down the front end, right? So that's one example. Um, some companies build the middle tier, and they want to make that their scale out story for many hundreds of applications in their industry. So like the hotel industry is an example that I've come across where they just have a middle tier of services that everybody's going to use, so it has to be able to scale. But they're not really so interested in, let's put the UIs in here. Those can stay on regular VMs and or PaaS environments, whatever they're using, right? So that's 
long running tasks, those have to be highly available. So they need a minimum two to be healthy, right? And if one fails, it will spin up a replacement. Uh, they'll be on different nodes, so that will give you your high availability. They're not going to put two on the same node, so that if the node goes, you're done. Um, you just get to decide what the minimum starting point is. Two would be the very minimum, because that means you have HA, or high availability, right? Um, so a web app, web API would be a good example of that. And then there's non-HA tasks that are maybe background processing. So I'm pulling from a queue, and I'm, or I'm consuming topics off of Kafka. And that process of consumption really just, you know, iterates, and maybe I might, uh, to scale out, implement um, a scale out strategy for those consumers so that they do have multiple at once to process faster on the topic. That's possible. Uh, it all depends on uh, you know what kind of messages are coming through and what kind of order you need to enforce and things like that, right? But the point is, um, the the processing tasks, if they fail, is anybody hurting, right? Not really. Messages are going to be staying in Kafka. They're going to be you know preserved. They're going to be archived. They're just waiting for somebody to pick them up. So the whole point of that would be maybe you don't have to scale that one out so big unless you're having a problem getting throughput of the messages through the system to their destination. So you can let it also have one instance, have that fail because something's wrong, like maybe the API it's trying to call has a bad database connection, and so the consumer starts to flap. You know, it can't run, it tries to process a message, it throws up on it, it stops. We want it to stop because that's an early warning of problems and failure in my system, and I want that warning. So I'm okay with letting it fail, right? So these are non-HA, and maybe okay to fail and restart on demand, yeah? And then there's jobs, you know? So I want to schedule jobs that run on a particular schedule per hour, let's say, um, or maybe they're just, I'm going to have a job ready and I'm going to launch it on demand, and that container will run and do something. Maybe it's a janitor, maybe it's some other thing, you know? Um, maybe it's going to generate reports and you don't know how often, so you just do it on demand. Um, some of them could be repeat, so like I'm going to run this job X number of times. I've, I've had some customers that need a job that can run 2,500 instances of it every day to pull some files from these remote locations. And so what do you do? Do you want to write 2,500 different containers? No, you're going to have one container and probably some automation process that launches the jobs and that gives them each a different configuration to run with. And so you can literally schedule 2,500 jobs, and what they will do is just wait for room to process. And if there's no room, they wait, right? So interesting things like that that you can do. So with that, um, I think we'll go ahead and just take a look around, right? So let me go over to my DCOS cluster. So a couple of, um, I guess, <coughs> observations, right? First, let me see if I can get you into a, a clearer view. Okay, so I'm, I'm in a uh, folder here that has a couple of, of things available to me. So for example, if I cat my tunnel, um, just to show you, what I'm doing is I'm tunneling into a DCOS cluster. So I've got a cluster up, um, and I'm going to set it up so that I can browse to the administrative UI. That's all. Um, so let me go ahead and run that. Yeah, there we go. And so once that's done, I can browse. So I'm going to go over here to my DCOS and refresh, and that ought to give me a decent picture. OK. Uh, so if this wasn't working, then I would obviously see an error. So I'm going to start by going into the nodes area. So in here, I get a picture of health. Overall, for my nodes, I can see that I've got 100% usage on this cluster. That's because that's my Kafka node. Um, so, it, oh no, sorry, that's Kronos, sorry. So this guy's actually using up the full CPU. It's requested 100% of it to uh, CPU. Now, these are small machines. And again, like I told you, Kronos, Kafka, Elastic would be three examples of things that you know, need a decent amount of, of uh, you know, CPU and memory to run effectively, right? 
So once I start putting those in the same cluster as my apps, which is totally fine, I do need a little more horsepower, right? So I have to do all kinds of dancing in here to get things deployed at, you know, so that my apps don't ask for a lot. But the reality is your apps probably don't need a lot to process. An API receives a request, the payload is reasonable, it calls a database, it's, it's really pretty lightweight, right? So we'll take a look at that. So this is one node. And uh, if I take a look over here, we've got another one at 80% with 50%-ish of memory left, and another one over here uh, with 50% uh, and quite a lot of memory left. So this guy, uh, you know, I've been running this cluster for a little while, right, with lots of different demo things and stuff, so I've certainly left some garbage behind, because um, that happens when you're playing. Um, so this is the node that appears to be, you know, interested in all of the applications right now. And so, you know, things will distribute between one or two of the nodes right now, because I only have three uh, available for deploying the applications. I have one public node, which has a load balancer, and then I've got an internal load balancer, and then I've got, you know, multiple applications, which we're going to go through. So when I look at my overall picture here, I'm looking at what memory am I using for the whole cluster? But, of course, individual machines might be full. And same thing goes for disk, so I'm not using a lot of disk right now. Okay. So that's a picture of health. And then I can come up here and take a look at my services. Actually, before I do that, this will show a different view of the same allocation. So I get a picture of you know, how much CPU and memory and disk allocation I've got over my whole cluster. Um, somebody asked me once, why is it flatline? I don't trust a flatline. That's the reservation, right? So it's not saying what you're using right now in the container. It's saying what you've asked for up to that limit to reserve. Make sense? And then, of course, this is all my tasks and whether or not any are staging or failing or whatnot. So that's it. All right, so let's go to services. So first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take a look at, and I know this is kind of a small window, so maybe I can squeeze that guy over a little bit. Maybe, maybe. No? OK, never mind. OK, so uh, what I'm going to do first is go in here. And um, you'll notice that I have these groups of applications. I have identity events, which is one application. And that one's depending on Kafka to run. And then I've got another one over here, which is just an API and a website. So what I've done is I suspend one in favor of the other, right? Uh, so I'm going to actually do a suspend on this whole group. And that will essentially shut them down. And then I'm going to go to this group, and I'm going to spin up the API and the website. So if I go to the API, and you know, just for the sake of it, right? Like if I hadn't deployed this yet, there's a lot of ways for me to get this deployed. I, there's a REST endpoint I can push the description to, or I can come in here and say, you know, create application or deploy a service, and it'll bring me to here, and I can create all the settings for the container, where's I, where to pull it from, and so on. Um, and then uh, we've got, of course an existing application, and I can go edit that same configuration. So this is actually an API. It's asking for 0.2 CPU. It's coming from my uh, Docker Hub account, Dust Blonde, and the Content API repo. And if I kind of just take a tour into the JSON, this is essentially your service configuration, which again is the equivalent of the compose file and so on. So I would have to build a script that generates the right sort of configuration for certain. You'll find there's common service characteristics that, that form in your solution, like um, consumers of messages look this way, uh, APIs tend to look this way, web apps tend to look this way. And so we know how to generate like the stitching to the ports, for example. Like for this one, it's an API, and I'll show you. Um, it's pulling from this image, and it's using uh, the internal load balancer port of 10,000, right? So that's how the web app is going to address this API and using DNS. It's going to go to the internal load balancer, and it's going to hit that port. So I can scale behind that port is the point. Um, the internal container port is 3001, but it's going to map to port a, port, uh, a dynamic port, so I'm not specifying one here. That way it can stitch automatically into the um, internal load balancer, which I specify here. So this is a marathon load balancer set of tags, and that's how it knows, OK, you've asked to be part of the internal load balancer group. And then, of course, by providing the service port, 
uh, it knows what port it should be using for this API. So forevermore, this guy will be port 10,000. Make sense? Okay, so when I deploy this, um, of course, it will usually create one instance, but because I suspended it before, it's actually at zero instances. So I'm gonna start by deploying one, and we'll do that and scale it. And then while that's deploying, you can see that was pretty fast. Um, and so the deployments are done, we're green, that usually is the picture of health, so we know we have an active uh, task. If I click on the task, I can go in here and I can see logs. That's usually interesting to do when you have problems, for example. Uh, come in here and go to the error, see if you have any errors. Um, go in here, see your standard out. Any of your logs will go here too. So that's just a couple of examples of things you can do. Uh, let's go back up to services and back into API. So I've got one running. My configuration is what I just showed you. Um, and if I ever can't see it running at all, I can go in here to debug and sort of see that the last time it failed, it failed because of this. It couldn't get the image. I gave it a bad image name, actually, so on purpose, right? Okay, so API's running. Uh, that's not gonna help much until I run web. So I'm gonna go ahead and run the website. So I'm gonna edit that config. And right now the website is, uh, oops, set for zero instances. So why don't I go ahead and say one and we'll go ahead and deploy. So that will be not HA yet, right? So the point is that web configuration is also uh, stitching up to the external load balancer at 10,001, meaning the public facing port 80 to this cluster. So I have two marathon load balancers deployed and this is saying what my IP address will be. So this is uh, attaching to the uh, Azure load balancer physically. So that means if I come up here and I go to that page, it's gonna show me the website. And if I click on speakers, it's calling the API. And if I've stitched up the API correctly, then I should see the sessions and the speakers, right? Um, if I go to the stats page, what I'm gonna see here Stats, HTML. Uh, the task identifier indicates which of the API instances we're hitting, but of course I only have one instance right now, for example, and also which front end task I'm hitting. And so these will not vary at all as long as I only have one instance of each. So we have to look at how we would auto scale that or how we would scale that. Um, so right now what I'll do is I'll go ahead and scale the website and we'll add another instance. And then I'm gonna to go to the API and I'm gonna scale that. And let's go ahead and try and add three instances. Now these are each asking for 0.2 CPU each and I've started to deploy quite a lot of stuff so it might not hurt to come down here and see what kind of spare do I have. You can see it's getting pretty tight but they also all, all may be running. So if I go to that node you can see a bunch of things are running and they're all on the uh, uh, point zero, point 0.7, right? So my IP address. If I go to services um, and come back over to Fab Medical, uh, it looks like I'm running both web instances. That's good. It looks like I'm not quite finished with the API. So there may be problem deploying all three because I'm asking for resources that we don't have to deploy, right? So the question is, is the app healthy in the meantime? So if we come over here, the deployment hasn't finished. Um, and as I refresh, you can still see that I'm getting a variation in the task. So it's brought up the two, and it's just, it's brought up one of the three that I asked for. I already had one, it added two more, but one of them hasn't come up yet, so I won't be able to hit that until such a time as it does. But you can see that the task IDs are flipping, right? So, so that's the idea. Um, so that gives me my HA, but I'm not complete here, of course, because of the waiting, and I'm waiting because my, I'm asking for too much. If I were to reduce this to 0.1, how much CPU do I need? How should I know? Does anybody know the answer to that? Is there a way to tell how much CPU I need, how much memory I need? I already told you earlier, right? We're gonna start like that, and then we're gonna try and whittle it down until you know we get it as small as we can, and then we do drills, and we're gonna see if we can break it. It's what you have to do. Um, so I'm gonna deploy this, and it's gonna say, I'm already in the middle of a deployment that's not finished. Do you wanna override it? Yes, I do. 
But the app's still gonna be running just fine, right? So I'm gonna still be able to keep doing this and nothing's gonna break because it's always gonna make sure that the instances, the minimum instances are running that I've asked for. And it will un, uh, it'll drain the others as it can. And it looks like now we're healthy. So a couple of new ones a couple seconds ago. And, uh, and then I've got the, the web app. So everything, oh, maybe not, sorry, I lied. Uh, it should be getting there though, I hope. Apparently I need a dictionary. So, it's still thinking. It looks like it's coming up though, because it's got four now, that means it's brought three and it's gonna drain. So I think we're still hope, have hope to get there. Let's see. Four tasks over capacity by one until we drain. I'm gonna go take a quick look at my notes and see what I've got. Ooh, yikes, maybe not. It's gonna get tight. And let's go back here. Okay, so this, uh, hang on, is this my API or my web? Yes, it's my API. Still thinking, they're saying it's all healthy, so let it keep thinking. This point two guy is the one that needs to go away. There we go, okay. Patience is a virtue. Sometimes it takes longer than expected. So um, when I look at the completed task, you can see that sometimes you've killed a task. That might be because you intentionally scaled it down. That's what happened here. Sometimes we see failure is because there's an error, and I'm going to click in and go look at the logs and see what happened to that service, for example. OK, so what I've shown you just there is how would I deploy a service? Again, the platforms vary a little bit, but the point was there is resources I'm gonna ask for. What I ask for is going to determine what kind of resources I, are, it needs. Therefore, uh, the scheduler has to decide where can I deploy those services, and that's gonna you know, be orchestrated for me, right? Um, and we've got our high availability, which is another good thing, and we've got our ability to scale, which I just showed you, right? So there's the starting point. Um, now, this set of services, Fab Medical, uh, that I just showed you, is this website that's running here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip over to a different example with Kafka. So I'm going to suspend this whole group and come back and hope to God that the other one comes back up uh, and that I have enough space, right? So there you go. Did I say that out loud? Okay. Sorry. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, you can't really start the whole group, at least from the UI here, together. So I've already got these um, APIs and things uh, configured, but I'm actually going to whittle it down just a little bit. And that's not going to deploy anything, because you noticed it said zero instances, right? So all it did was update my configuration, the task definition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this API. This API's job is one job in life, and its job is to um, process the messages that are sent from the UI through a consumer. So it will be called by the consumer in order to write to a DocDB, OK? So I'm going to scale this service to one for now. And I'm going to have an API that's running. Next thing I'm going to need is the consumer, right? So the consumer is actually uh, consuming Kafka messages. So I, I actually maybe should have showed you that we do have a Kafka instance running. I only have a single broker for space, right? I would normally have three at a minimum. So um, maybe just to point out something, and that is that Kafka is, is an executor. And so when you deploy that, DCOS schedules the Kafka executor, and then the executor says, how many brokers do you want, and so on, and it manages its own brokers in your DCOS cluster. It's not a container, which we're glad about. Um, it's actually running on the metal, and it's a process. It's just being scheduled, uh, which you can do, right? So the scheduler can, process, can run processes, it can run Linux containers, Docker containers, and so forth, right? So in this case, it's a process, it's an executor, and it's got a whole bunch of config settings that say things like, how many brokers do you want? So for example, if I were to search for broker, broker, and I'm not getting there. There we go. Somewhere, broker, broker, broker. And it will say how many I'm asking for. Somewhere. 
it's really hard to find these things in here. So, maybe I would have to go to the config. So, hold everything. Oh, I was in the I was in the task. Sorry, that's why. The task definition is 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 up here. So this is where I would go. So this is saying uh, broker. Let's see, broker. Is it highlighted? How many brokers do I want? Broker count, one. So if I, I would normally have three as a minimum, so that's the idea. So it's got its own number of environment variables, configuration settings that it manages for you. So DCOS's responsibility is just to keep the executor alive. <laughs> the executor's responsibility is to keep the broker alive and manage all of the zookeeper interactions and so on, right? Okay. So what Kafka is, is of course a um, message broker and it's gonna be receiving messages from the client. And so where I was going with that is my consumer is gonna be the one processing the topic. And so the topic, there's actually a, a topic for history and there's a topic for uh, login data. So this is an interactive application that will let me simulate a login, a lockout, login, logout, reset password, and putting those events through the system in a uh, event sourcing style format with past tense events carrying the fact that happened, right? A user logged in, a user was logged out, uh, exceeded retries, that kind of thing. And so I'm gonna start the consumer, and again, this guy, I only really need one instance, right, for it to run. Because if this consumer dies, the messages just stay waiting. And I want to be alerted, so I like it when that goes red here, because that's just a way to fail fast, right? Again, there's lots of ways to do stuff, that's just what we happen to uh, subscribe to uh, in some recent examples. So let's go to the website. So the website, um, I'm gonna actually, again, sort of push down how much it's asking for, and go to deploy one instance of the website. So now I have a website, sending message to Kafka, Kafka being consumed by the consumer, so listening on the topic, and then calling the API, and then the API shipping those updates to the user database. So once the website's running, I'll be able to do a, uh, a run through of that. And just to show you, I do have the database over here. So right now, if I were to run a query on management, and let's do that. And let's see how many users I have in here. So c.username. Let's see what I have. So these are the names that I've put in there so far. Just so that you know, like I have nothing up my sleeve. If I add a new name, it didn't already exist. Uh, no smoke and mirrors. Okay. So the web is still thinking. This guy seems to take time to run though, so I think I need to be patient. Um, I'm, at the same time, I'm gonna go and check out these uh, nodes. So I do have space, it's looking okay. Let's come back over here. And I think we're, ooh, are we flapping? Could be. So now, I'm not quite sure if I just saw that flip. And I've got this completed count of 57. If that goes up again seconds ago, right? then that means it's failing and it's trying to keep starting it and it's gonna never give up. So we need to figure out why that might be flapping uh, as soon as I see if the count goes up here. So give another second. I'm suspicious that that might happen or maybe I'm actually just successful, let's see. Darn it, I wanted it to fail, no. Actually it is running. We'll make a failure later, don't worry. I, I, I was um, looking forward to that. Okay. Well, maybe we found our failure after all. It may not actually be flapping after all, because that's not so good. Let's see. Ah, do you see it? Disappeared, came back, staging again. Okay, we're flapping. So it's running for a bit, and then it's blowing up. Why? I'm gonna go to my instance, and I'm gonna check the logs. See what I've got? Uh, could be a health check issue sometimes. Uh, so data, okay, so this is nothing important, but there looks to be some other logs up here, standard out, let's go to standard error. No, these are actually not, these are just warnings, so they're not an issue. 
So let's go over to the actual service. So I'm going to go up a level. And let's go to debug. Task failed with 137. OK, so usually when that happens, um, it's, it's, I mean, something is running and failing, basically, and, fi and it's not able to launch. So I'm going to go edit my config here and see what I could have done. So let's go in here. And it could even be I need more resources. I don't think so, but I'm going to just toss that back where it was. And we're going to take a look at the configuration in here. Am I hitting the right broker? That could be another reason to fail, but that looks good. Um, it looks like I'm pulling from the right repository. It looks like I have all the right ports that I had already in place, so that's all good. Um, so there's really no obvious reason, so let's go ahead and deploy that and see if by making a change in deploying, I can actually recover. And so go over here to active tasks. It's running, but is it going to fail is the question. Give it a try. OK. I'm, I'm going to just see what the latest error is. So let's go in here. So this is a failed request. And we'll go back to those logs and see what we can find. There's got to be an explanation. Um, so this is all just health check. And this data protection key is just a warning, so that's something for ASP.NET. Producers created, that's good, so that's expected. Uh, what it could be doing, we will see. I knew I shouldn't have suspended that. Darn it, it's all working. Running seconds ago. So, 62, we're bordering on the unexpected at this point. I'm going to see what I can do to look at resources. Okay. Two minutes. That was the last failure two minutes ago. Seconds ago, not good. Not good. Hmm. I'd have to think now. A minute ago, well, no, that's good. That means it's still there. So we may have actually succeeded, maybe. Maybe. Not available. No, that's not what I want. Just regular endpoint. Ooh. OK, so it's not coming up. Something's wrong. Um, now I'm going to have to figure that out. Let's see. <coughs> How many tries should I give it? This one, it's got a new image. Somebody tell a joke or something. Jeez. Accepted resource role, any, that's fine. I could call this slave public and see if it goes. OK. If it's a resource issue, I might need to get it onto another node. And the public node has some space. And since it's the public-facing website, I can tell it that it should have affinity with the public. So let's see about that. Although, very seriously, this was running right before I shut it down, so <laughs> this is fun. OK, uh, what else can I do? Make these smaller, not to use so many resources. No other real or realistic thing that it could be. Um, if I had versioning on my images, that would be helpful. But I'm pretty much calling everything latest. So. Uh, yeah, that. Let's see, events demo. Events demo, web. 
Okay. I'm going to just show you the end of the demo then, if that doesn't work out. And you're going to pretend you saw it, and then I'm going to deneuralize you with this. <laughs> and it's going to be awesome. Yeah, just be ready for that. Okay. So tags, what have I got in here? Everything's latest, and it hasn't been updated by somebody else checking in stuff behind my back, so it should be fine. It's my blog, right? Okay, so let's see if it's running, and if it's not running, then I'm gonna have to use brute force somewhere here. Let's see what we got. Are we actually running this time? Oh, thank God. <laughs> I'm just gonna drink, this is vodka? by the way, I'm just gonna have a little bit, just, just a lot, maybe, okay. Um, so, who, uh, Vodka, that's a good name for a user. One, two, three, email, vodka at demofail.com. But it actually succeeded, so, well, that's okay. So, the, is this getting filmed? That's awesome. Um, I just said all those things. Um, so, so this UI is going to send a message when I hit create user, so I'll ship that off. Um, and then once I have a user that's been created, so we're not thinking about events in the system. So my UIs are all going to send events of a thing that happened, and then it's going to be processed by the back end. So the consumer will pull the events, uh, or, uh, the messages out of Kafka, and then call the API, and the API is going to project a current state store of that message that says user created, and it's gonna update the user record. So when a user's registered, that's one message. When the user verifies their email, it will update the fields that verify the email. Uh, when I hit login, it will really do nothing to the user record because that's just a login record, but it would be useful for history, right? So there's that. Um, I can log out, I can have a failed login attempt up to two, so this is just simulating the end of that message, so every time I log in, there's gonna be a message generated by that runtime API somewhere else, and it's gonna say, um, if it hits the, the, the limit in the business rules, it's gonna say, you know, failed attempts X, and it's gonna lock me out and set my user record to locked out with a number of failed attempts. And then I can, so simulate that with a lock account, simulate an unlock, and simulate a password reset. So these are all things that I'd interact with UI. It would trigger either a message that's doing a write, so if I'm separating my writes and optimizing read, then messages are for all the writes. And then sometimes when I'm reading or logging in, other messages are generated that indicate a state change as well, right? And then some of those messages may just be history. Um, so if I come into my DocDB, I should be able to run this and see that new user, so Vodka is here. Um, and then if I want to um, check the history table, I should be able to see history because there's a second consumer running that can produce history. So for example, if I said, show me history, show me uh, C dot underscore message type and let's run that. Um, so now I'm gonna see real history, and I could, of course, organize this by user. Right now I'm just showing you quickly. So user created, user logged in, failed, locked out, unlocked, and then there's more data in each of these messages. I'm just showing you the list, right? And so this becomes now um, a different projection, a history projection, and where it's coming from is this guy over here, my history. So that might be old history, just saying, because I had this suspended, all that later, and I obviously had some other data in there. But, um, you know, this is gonna work too. Um, and the point is that it will generate for then that user that I just ran, right? The vodka user. Um, so you'll see email confirmed and all of the, the, the messages that came. So I've got a projection of the current state, a projection of history that I could have brought on later on that replayed those messages, and I have a message archive. Now, when we talk about the scheduling aspect, the thing that matters about the scheduling aspect is the following. If I go into this API and I edit it, and I go into, say, the container settings, and I call this API2 and I redeploy. So something's gonna happen where the API is not available now, right? So let's go see. Um, it's going to, is it going to be unavailable though? It's a good question. Um, 
So this API is now waiting. So there's a deployment waiting. Waiting is bad, so waiting automatically means something's up. And so if I go back into API over here and look at debug, it's gonna say it couldn't find the container. So is the system down? Probably not, why? If I create a new user, beer, because why not? Beer at thirsty.com. And so let's go ahead and create that user, and let's go over here into our docdb and go back to my management table and do that listing again of user name and run the query, and I have beer. So the API is up and running, even though I have a failed deployment in the, in the works, and that's because it won't retire the existing until I have a successful deployment. Um, and so where is this? So I'm in a particular task. Let's go into the API. Deployment's still trying to run. I'm gonna go edit this. I don't see my API too. That's kind of weird. Hmm. Did it not save that? That's weird. Okay. What's that? Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I knew that. Um, of course, I knew that. So this is going to replace that deployment, and then it'll come back to life. Now it can only do that if it has space. So if I'm really tight on space on the node, it won't even be able to spring up the new one and retire and drain the old one, right? Okay, so let's try a different failure, which is kind of important. If I go over to my services and again, hit that API, what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna change an environment variable. I actually have a uh, docdb service endpoint and we're gonna call this NDC mini two and deploy that change. So now I have a new environment configuration, bad database reference, and it will, uh, so it's not gonna bring down the other service, right? So I need to make it actually go to zero so that I can deploy the bad guy. So I'm gonna do that. Don't do this in production. This is just a demo, people. Uh, so now I'm gonna go to one and get a bad deployment out there. Isn't it nice to know that's hard to do? Okay. Mission accomplished, yes. Um, so. We're flapping. It's trying to access the database right away. Now the question is, what's gonna happen with the consumer if I start hitting the web page? So let's go ahead and go back home and we'll call this one Martini, because we're on a roll. Uh, Freshbar.com, okay, great user. So that's written to Kafka. The consumer is gonna pick up a message and it's going to try to process that message. So it's gonna also try to hit the API. And when this guy tries to do that, at some point it will fail to replay that message and it will just stop and it will start flapping as well. We want that flapping because that's a good flap in the sense that I'm not losing anything. My still HA API is up and running so I have high availability, no problem. Um, <coughs> but what I'm not, what I don't have is, uh, what I do want is a quick indicator, right, of the um, failure of, of the ingester or the consumer so that I can investigate, right, what's really wrong with the whole system. And it's just a, you know, a great way to sort of quickly get alerted instead of letting it have messages and I have to go to the logs and so on. I mean, this is like surfacing an actual component not running, which is sort of an earlier warning, if you will. So we like to do that sometimes. Um, okay, so moral of that story is you've got the scheduled HA things, you've got the ingester that would be okay to try to pull and flap and fail eventually if it can't uh, access uh, the resource it needs to do its job. And lastly, um, we can talk about jobs, so let's do that. So, quick, example of some jobs that can run. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm actually uh, gonna show you very quickly if I wanted to add a job, schedule job, um, you know, I can put just a command, right? Literally, uh, I could say something like, I don't know, dash C uh, less than, uh, let's see, I wanna do like ping, 
uh, snapboard.com or something. So like I can ping a destination. I can call this one ping two. And I can go to the advanced options and do some things. Uh, I can set this to a zero. That just means don't schedule it and uh, it will just run once. And so I'm gonna go ahead and add the job. So this guy will say it's overdue already uh, because it doesn't have a schedule and it will run when I tell it to and this will try to schedule that job on my cluster. Now, all that's gonna do is run a console that just iterates a ping, just for the point of saying that you can run commands, you can do janitor activities, you can do things like that. But probably more interesting are things like having an actual job. So this is an example of a job, let me go edit this, that is, um, it's running a container. These are the environment variables for the container. Uh, what if I had that concept that I gave you with the other customer where, for example, they had to pull data from many different locations uh, in their organization and they did it on schedule. So if the job could be scheduled the same container but run 2,500 different ways and something automates pushing that, like your CI process, your CI CD process for that job, um, and then that job is just here and it knows to run every day. So it will schedule all these guys. And so that job, when I hit, say, go, go, uh, job three and job four, it's going to queue those jobs to run. But they need resources, right? So what's going to really happen is they're going to wait. They're not going to quite get out here to the DCOS until there's actually some room for them to run. Um, so in terms of tasks, active tasks, we're not going to see any activity on those jobs until um, you know, we have some space to run. So if I go to the nodes, for example, uh, and let's say I go to this guy, I may or may not see one of the jobs running just yet. So you see this is showing me the activity here. It's still trying to run the API. It's not working out. So I'm going to go to the services and I'm going to get this guy suspended. Let's get rid of that old demo. Let's make some space. Let's go back to the nodes and let's watch what happens on this guy. So this is now um, waiting, possibly, for something to get scheduled. I'm gonna go over to Kronos, and I should be able to see things are queued. Oh, and it might have already run. There you go. How about we try that again? Job, job, job. There you go. And at the end, bye. Only one more minute. No, just kidding. <laughs> and so this is showing me the job. All right. I found the job that's running, job three. It will schedule as it has time. All 2,500 could sit there. They'll schedule. They'll wait for resources. It doesn't interfere with the rest of your cluster. And that would be all we have to say about that. And so this task is running the job, and it's going to end up with some output as it iterates through the ping. And at the end of it, it will retire, and the Kronos will show that it ran at whatever point in time. And so, I guess with that, uh, I've shown you at least four or five different scheduling sort of capabilities and also sort of an overview, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> and the demo finally worked. That was awesome. I had to clean off images from a VM to get that to work, so hey. I was just going to say that. I don't want to tell you that in the beginning because that would have really set us up for failure, so I was just hoping for the best. Yeah. All right. Cheers.